Hi folks, this is Astronomy Live. I'm going to be doing a point-by-point -point debunk of the next level. Now I'm going to be using the standard definition free version of this video available on YouTube and BitChute. There is an HD version available, but it's behind a paywall. And I frankly don't want to create a dumpster fire of copyright strikes and fair use responses, etc, etc, all because I used the HD version that was behind a paywall. Fair use does require using the minimum for a response, and technically, you could argue that because they've made a free standard definition version available, in order to respond to this video, that's all you really need. And that's fair enough, so that's what I'm going to stick with. Now, you may be wondering why this video isn't on my own channel. Well, my channel lately has gotten further and further away from debunking, and has a more narrow focus on doing real astronomy, and creating new software tools for tracking asteroids, satellites, rockets, and the like. And that's really where the focus of my channel is these days. So I don't want to distract from that by posting an hour-long video, or more, responding to a Flat Earth documentary. It just doesn't fit the theme of my channel anymore. With that said, I do want to thank Red's Rhetoric for hosting this video, and everyone else who's also willing to share it. So now let's get into the next level. The one thing globe believers need to understand is that you don't just take the spinning ball Earth and flatten it out and put it back in the heliocentric model. Like it's just the only misfit planet and it's flat and the rest of the planets are round. No Flat Earther has ever said that, no Flat Earther will ever say that, because it's not what we believe. The Earth isn't a pancake floating in outer space, and you will never hear a Flat Earther say that. And if you would ever actually take the time to study it for yourself, or hear a Flat Earther through, then you would find that it's much different and things would actually make more sense. He's right about one thing, what they actually believe is quite different much more extreme, and even easier to debunk. This footage of Venus can be seen later in the documentary, but the rest of this video is actually from a totally different video on Eric Dubay's channel. This shows what they claim the planets look like with a P900. It's actually out of focus. This is not what planets and stars look like with proper telescopes properly focused. You can see plenty of footage like that on my channel. Here's some for an example, a time-lapse that I recorded of the planet Mars. Here's a side-by-side -side of his out-of-focus real-time footage on the right versus my in-focus time-lapse footage on the left. They've got the narrative control to where anyone that goes to search for this, they're going to see pancakes floating up in space, you know, and it turns people away. Or they see a snow globe, a snow globe out in the middle of space with water falling off the sides, and they're like, what is this? turns them away. The mainstream agenda was to push their false narrative. Definitely noticing a trend here of the sad music with the sad flat earther, the oppressed flat earther, their beliefs aren't fairly represented. Honestly, you should go check out Behind the Curve. I think it does a great job of fairly representing their beliefs and showing the flaws in their belief system, but it even does a good job of sympathizing with how they've slipped through the cracks. It doesn't just make fun of them. And so, highly recommend that people go check it out if they haven't already. Really good documentary. All right, moving on. All these hit pieces on Flat Earth. 2016, 2017, uh, th that was pretty much the end of the YouTube era uh, where we could actually find real evidence, real you know content any search engine, it's the algorithms are, are suited to their favor. You're, you're going to see all the hit pieces, you're going to see all the stuff that's there to debunk Flat Earth. So it's just, uh, it's almost impossible to get the real information. So we see more of the typical sad, poor, oppressed Flat Earther. I hate to break it to him, but Flat Earth isn't the truth. Nevertheless, it's true that YouTube is suppressing Flat Earth on their platform. They openly stated this in a blog post on the official YouTube blog back in January 2019. They openly state that they are going to reduce recommendations of what they consider to be borderline content, and among other things, they specifically name Flat Earth. So it's true that Flat Earth is harder to find on YouTube today than it was even a few years ago. And that's because they've altered the algorithm to push that content down. 
Now, what I'm about to say is going to surprise a lot of people, and there's a lot of people who debunk Flat Earth that are going to disagree with me on this, but personally, I don't like this strategy, for a couple of reasons. For one thing, it helps insulate their community. Now, this has the beneficial effect, perhaps, of making it harder for people to fall into the trap of that belief system to begin with, but for the people already in it, it does nothing to draw them out of that belief system and, in fact, makes them harder to reach. While it's true that some Flat Earthers have left the movement recently, still others have actually died because they've been ignoring medical advice. Flat Earth is not a harmless belief. Once you're that deep in the rabbit hole, it's not just about disbelieving that the Earth is round. It's about distrusting science in general, and that can have a very negative effect on your life when you start ignoring what science is saying about other things that have a more immediate and direct impact on your health and well-being. The other reason I disagree with this strategy is, I admit, a little bit selfish, and that's the fact that the algorithm typically does such a poor job at distinguishing between content that promotes a conspiracy theory and content that refutes the conspiracy theory. And to a large extent, it seems like YouTube doesn't care. I've seen a number of cases where a video was demonetized or even taken down because it was said to have promoted misinformation. Upon manual review, that decision was upheld because they said the video repeated the claim even though it immediately refuted the claim. And that alone was enough to violate the rules. Um, analytic will give you government hate propaganda against the flat earth truth. If you go to Google and try to find anything flat earth related, then the first thing that's going to pop up is the flat earth society. And that is something that has absolutely nothing to do with this movement. In fact, it's um, a completely made up organization in order to deter anybody looking for some sort of truth. Interesting that she would complain about an organization of flat earthers who are allegedly insincere in their beliefs. In a later episode, we will see evidence that whoever edited the video must have realized that it was a lie, and therefore, they too are insincere in their beliefs. Now everything's fine in court until somebody walks in with a load of shit on you. Everything's fine until somebody out there has evidence that's going to prove you guilty. guilty. Let's freeze it here for a moment. This collage, highlighting the words flat, non-rotating Earth, is taken from a technical note published when? Well, it says right there, library copy, April 17th, 1961. It didn't take long to locate the original technical note. You can see it's even the same scan based on the horizontal lines going across it. And you can see indeed it was published in April 1961. Now, what was different over 60 years ago? Well, a lot of things, but among other things, the amount of computing power that was readily available. Let's take a closer look. Here's the section containing the statement highlighted by the Flat Earthers, the reference to a flat, non-rotating Earth. The sentence immediately following that is very important, though. It says, this trajectory simulation was programmed on the IBM 704 electronic data processing machine. Let's see if we can figure out why that might be important in making the decision to calculate the missile's position relative to a simple, flat, non-rotating Earth. The IBM 704 computer could perform multiplication and division at a speed of about 4,000 operations per second. Now it could perform simple addition and subtraction operations much faster, but more complicated trigonometric functions would take longer to do. Trigonometric functions could be performed using a Taylor series or lookup table, but this would involve potentially a dozen multiplication events or more, and this would take longer to do than a simple multiplication or division event on its own. So how long would it take to calculate for the shape and rotation of the Earth? Let's do a little math and find out. These pages from the book Practical Astronomy with Your Calculator show how to calculate for the shape and rotation of the Earth. This includes calculating for such effects as nutation and precession. The Earth's axis is not always pointed in the same direction. In fact, it's constantly changing over time. And these calculations require an extensive series of trigonometric functions to be performed. In total, I count about 109 trigonometric functions that need to be calculated, and an additional 98 multiplication or division calculations that need to occur. Given that the trigonometric functions will take about a dozen times longer to perform than a simple multiplication or division, this will require the equivalent of about 1,400 multiplication or division events to occur, out of the 4,000 that can be performed per second. 
If we were only computing things for a single moment in time, that might not seem like a significant impact. But that's not the purpose of these calculations. We have to go back to the original purpose of this program, which is a trajectory simulation and to study the effects of wind on the rocket's trajectory. To do that, you need to calculate the position of the rocket across many points in time. Let's take one more look at the date this was published. The library received a copy, April 17, 1961. That is less than a month before Alan Shepard would become the first American in space while launching on Freedom 7 on top of a Mercury Redstone rocket, a suborbital flight that only lasted 15 minutes. Let's say you wanted to calculate the full 15-minute trajectory of the rocket with a time resolution of 0.01 seconds. That would require 90,000 steps to be calculated, and with each step requiring about a third of a second to calculate for the shape and rotation of the Earth while taking into account the nutation and precession of Earth's axis to be as accurate as possible, this would require about 8 hours of time for the IBM 704 to calculate, and that's without calculating anything for the rocket itself, that is allowing no time for any calculation of the rocket's thrust, its acceleration, its aerodynamics, or the wind as described in this paper, that is just calculating for the shape and rotation of Earth with an IBM 704 computer. Now you might be thinking to yourself, what's the big deal? Sure, it's another 8 hours, but we know computers back then were slower. Why not let it run overnight? What difference does it make? Why not calculate for the shape and rotation of the Earth? Might as well. Well, you have to keep in mind, these computers were not nearly as reliable as the computers we enjoy today. No, in fact, here's a quote that states the IBM 704 had a mean time to failure of about 55 minutes in this person's experience. Now, Wikipedia quotes a more conservative 8-hour mean time to failure, and that was considered reliable back then. Yes, those old vacuum tube computers running on punch cards were a lot less reliable than what we have today. So. Adding an additional 8 hours to a program meant not just adding more time, but more risk of failure. It was therefore not only common, but important back then to simplify programs as much as possible to focus on just what it was you wanted to study, in that case, the effect of wind on a rocket without considering the shape or rotation of the Earth. Of course, it was important for them to openly state what assumptions and simplifications they were making. They weren't saying that they thought the Earth was flat or non-rotating. They were simply telling everyone what factors they hadn't computed for when they made these calculations. You start acting suspicious, that's when you start panicking, that's when you start putting con uh, damage control out there, which is inevitably what these bots are, what these trolls are on social media, and of course, the algorithms. Going for the shill gambit pretty early there, claiming that FTFE, MC Tune, and others like myself are really just damage control. Speaking of damage control, I'm interested to see what kind of response they have to this video. But that's going to do it for this first episode, debunking the next level. There will be future episodes, so stay tuned and subscribe for more. And until next time, I'll be doing more real astronomy, like tracking ISS here. Thanks for watching, and clear skies.